Good afternoon, everybody. It is so good to see all of you here on this fine St. Patrick's Day afternoon in Tucson. The weather is cooperating with us. Everything seems to be in good shape. Um, it is a joy for me, Steve Nash, as the new president and CEO, to look over this room at the Arizona Inn and see so many uh, uh, famous archaeologists. This is a who's who of Southwestern archaeology, including a whole series of my former professors, which is not intimidating at all. <laughs> Uh, it's also a thrill to, to meet so many new supporters of Archaeology Southwest. And before we get going with the program, I want to acknowledge some of our sponsors uh, this afternoon. First and foremost, our, the chair of our board, Dan Kimball, and his wife, Kit Kimball, over here. Sponsors, thank you. Uh, we have Jeff and Catherine Amy back in the, in the back there. Thank you for your support. Tim Schaffner and Ann Malley Schaffner are here. Yep, there they are. Thank you. Thank you for your support. And Edward Jones Financial Company here is at that table over there. So thank you, Edward Jones and Company. Did also want to mention very quickly that the, this tea has been being hosted, being held for probably a quarter century at least. Many of you have been to many of them. Um, and it was a benefit of the Heritage Circle uh, membership at Archaeology Southwest, $1,000 or more per year. We used to name all of those Heritage Circle members, but now there are so many of you that we can't name you individually. But I thank you collectively. Any chance you could raise your hands if you're Heritage Circle membership? No shame here, folks. Raise those hands. Yep, thank you so much. There's like 34 in the room. 30, yeah. <laughs> Stay standing, Linda. Linda, stay standing. We got to thank Linda Pierce for organizing and taking care of so much of all of this. Thank you for doing that. And we've got uh, Kate Sarther and Alicia Hansel over there as well. Also helpers, please stand. You gotta stand. All right, uh, I am gonna turn the mic over to uh, Bill Doley, who you know and love. You wanna hear from him first and foremost. His new title, President Emeritus and Senior Advisor, I think is a pretty cool title. Uh, Bill is gonna share with us his perspective, deep time perspective on Archaeology Southwest and um, expansive view of Archaeology Southwest, all that it's done, and then I will come back up here and we'll have a little bit of a conversation about where I think as new president and CEO, we could be headed. The man needs no introduction, uh, but give him a round of applause. Bill Doley, come on up. So great to be back. 2019 was the last time we were here in this room together. So it's been a really, really long time. Thank you all for coming out today. It's much appreciated. So I was listening to NPR driving around Tucson the other day and somebody uh, had, was being interviewed, an author who had just finished a book project and he described, I just see an empty landscape around me. Uh, I have no vision as to where I'm gonna go next and what's out there on that landscape. That is not my experience of reaching the retirement um, end of, 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 of uh, employment there. I see such a rich landscape and I see many things that I wanna continue staying engaged in. I see many new things that I want to forge off in new directions. So um, in thinking about talking about this wonderful organization, um, Archaeology Southwest and its history. Uh, it's been really difficult to pack it into a tiny space because I see incredible um, diversity of past actions and, and uh, things that could be covered. So I'm gonna miss a lot of things, but I've tried to boil it down to sort of three main themes. Um, Archaeology Southwest has always been place-based. So I wanna talk about place as the uh, what brings people together. And I want to <clears throat> talk about how we've gotten, uh, expanded our scale and scope over time. Just some of the, the big milestones and ways in which that change has happened over time. And then third, a commitment to 
advancing diversity in our board and in our uh, staff and in how we work with particularly uh, Native communities. So our commitment to tribal collaboration. So those are three big themes. And I see nonprofits like Archaeology Southwest as engines of change. Um, and that means that uh, we are, have a mission. Um, it's right there. Uh, it has changed over time, but exploring and protecting heritage places while honoring their diverse values. Seeing that mission implemented is directed towards uh, many changes as well. So, but let's start with place. Uh, I like to share with students for our field school uh, the concept of sense of place because I think that's a lot of, uh, I think that's a pretty commonly held uh, approach um, among many people. And this is my personal story, um, an 1880s lighthousekeeper's house in northern Michigan on the shores of Lake Superior. Uh, there was actually a standing uh, small tower on the beach uh, shown there uh, when I was up there in my you know, seven-year-old kind of age. Um, and it was a place where family went every summertime. And in the center of there, my grandmother's just like half in the, in the frame, but cousins and my brother and myself uh, roasting hot dogs on the beach. Um, so it, places like this are where you hear stories from the people that come together, where new stories are forged and, and carry you forward. So even though I haven't been in this place uh, for a long time, it's not in our family anymore, it's still um, deep in my heart. So um, that concept of, of place, I think is um, really important and um, maybe a little different um, view of, uh, from Rebecca Sosi, who, who's uh, Yaki and is at the U of A uh, law school. Um, to be indigenous is to belong to the land through time and through tradition. Again, another way to think about place. And hopefully all of you can kind of think about special places um, that you know and uh, think about how powerful that can be in guiding your thinking about your past and, and sometimes for thinking about how you wanna move forward. So we go way back. In 1982, we were actually a different entity altogether, the Institute for American Research. And there was really little or nothing to work with um, in that framework that came from the organization. Fortunately, back in those days, the uh, state had a grant program where actually 70, 30, you could bring 30% of the time and effort uh, in on volunteers and they actually gave you the other 70% in cash. So the red dot on the map there is Tucson. And those little blue dots around it are various and different significantly sized surveys that we did back in, in that era. So adapting to uh, the local space. And in eight, 1986, we published the first issue of what we called back then archaeology in Tucson as a newsletter. And that has continued forward to this day um, as now Archaeology Southwest Magazine. So uh, this was the, the microscopic beginnings. And you see, we, we ask on the headline there, what is archaeology in Tucson? And go on to explain our mission. And the back to the map, that long sort of boxy line on the right is this, the work out in the San Pedro Valley that was initiated back in this early era. So 1990, we started out there. So again, looking at our local um, setting and figuring out where we live, where we work, where we uh, care to uh, invest our energy and, and uh, move forward. So, and move forward we did. Um, in 1997, we received a single gift, $1.8 million. And it really changed our view of what was possible. 
that we didn't have to be a, you know, one generation organization, we could be a multi-generation into the future organization. And so first of all, we said we can view our home as a bigger place. Uh, so the Southwest became our home. 1999 is when Linda Pierce, who organized the event today, came on as our st staff member. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and we changed the name of the magazine to Archaeology Southwest. D dealt with a big issue, uh, early maze across the entire uh, Southwest, even into Northwest Mexico. And <clears throat> it wasn't in this first issue of Archaeology Southwest, but the very next one where the column backsite on the back uh, page of the magazine uh, started to be written by moi. Um, and it was an opportunity to think about the organization's mission and how it related either to the specific things that we were doing at the time, to the particular magazine issue, et cetera. And it's, it's continued up to uh, today. And in the next issue that's coming out soon, Steve and I co-author the, the last of those. My transition is, is being eased out <laughs> by co-authorship. So looking forward to that. But uh, there was another big transition um, in 2012. And that's where <clears throat> we finally figured out that the name that we'd been using for that magazine really made sense for us as an organization. Sometimes good information has a, is only slowly pen, penetrates thick skulls. Um, and the, we reorganized the magazine, and here it's, the headline is, what is preservation archaeology? By 2015, when this map was made, had covered all these little uh, numbers and, and uh, spots on the, on the map are different locations for magazine issues that covered uh, regions. Uh, and there's been a lot of other key magazines since then. Um, the Bears Ears issue from 2017 uh, after, or 2018 after uh, Trump downsized Bears Ears National Monument. The Chacoan, uh, one of many Chaco issues, but uh, a, a major issue on Chaco, one on Mimbris, and the joy that I had of wrapping up with Love of the Gila. This magazine has been our flagship. It's been our way of, of reaching out to um, a broad audience across the nation. We've had members at sometimes from every of the 50 states. And so we are not just a Tucson or even a, just an Arizona organization by any means. And it's probably one of the most important elements of, of our ability to reach out broadly and share the positives and share information about uh, preservation archaeology and the important places that are involved. The active protecting of places was also an opportunity that came through. In 20, 2007, we were able to hire Andy Lorenzi as a, uh, to run our site protection program and start building a, um, literally a portfolio of places that we protect. The map has two colors on it. The darker color are uh, conservation easements that we hold on properties, and the um, lighter colors are places that we own outright. And you'll notice that they run across uh, particularly the southern part of the Southwest, but also up in, into uh, central and northern New Mexico. So there's 23 preserves at this point. And look in the lower left and you see the label Texas Hill. This last week, we've lost one of the um, important donors and uh, advocates for protection with um, Eldon Smith passing away. So this is a photograph of the Gene Eldon and Jay um, out at Texas Hill back in 2018. Their, their uh, support allowed us to purchase Texas Hill. And it was a cute visit. Eldon um, saw the hill and, and had this comment that, that's a very nice hill. <laughs> 
and it is. <laughs> it's, it's a gorgeous place. That's a, it's a, a landscape marker um, out in that lower Gila area. It's got petroglyphs on the riverside. It used to have a, a hot spring, and there's trails around and up it as well. So it's a, a really important piece of our um, portfolio of protected places. And again, uh, Eldon was always advocating uh, for protection. So uh, Smith couldn't make it today, but uh, our hearts and, and condolences go out to the family for that loss. Preservation Archaeology Field School, another really important collaboration. Partnerships, collaborations, ways of working together have always been critical for the successes of um, Archaeology Southwest. And this is a partnership with the uh, University of Arizona's uh, School of Anthropology. And since 2011, we've had 108 students go through this program. And the grant that supports this program, um, there's been Karen Schollmeyer, the, the director of the field school, has had two uh, research experience for undergraduates uh, actually covers the majority of the costs of the students. And we're changing the field school this year. Um, it won't be an excavation field school, but it will be a partnership with the, an additional partnership with the Western New Mexico University and their museum. They have a mi massive collection from the Nan Ranch of Mimbris artifacts that have been brought to the museum. They're not cataloged. They're not available for, for research. And the purpose of this uh, field school is to start that cataloging process, also to have a component of the field school go out and research, excuse me, resurvey um, the ranch, Nan Ranch, where the excavation originally took place. So what is the condition of this site and the other sites on the ranch today? And then Alan DeNoyer, who runs our um, hands-on program would take people up to our location in, in uh, Cliff and Gila, New Mexico, and give them their hands-on experience. So it was, it's a, I think it's a great example of you don't have to dig. Um, they would, they, the students would be cataloging and doing research with the artifacts they're, they're cataloging. But we didn't get the grant this year. Um, so that means that the subvention, basically, that the grant was providing to students is not going to be available. And um, the key thing about that um, subvention is that it allowed students who weren't financially capable of you know, paying uh, full price, that offset of their tuition costs allowed them to go to the field school. So Karen's. Uh, calculated that 52% of the uh, students that have attended um, the field school over this time are from underrepresented uh, groups. And so I'm particularly concerned that that diversity and teaching um, you know, the diverse um, groups out there that are interested in archaeology but just can't afford to be archaeologists is at risk. So. Um, Talking with my wife, um, we're going to provide a five thousand dollar gift to Archaeology Southwest for the um, to support the field school. I'm talking to <laughs> Steve can follow up on this, but my understanding is that the Founders Fund that um, is his. I won't call it a slush fund, but it's, it's his, his, his fund that he can use in this transition will also uh, match that 5,000. And I think with this kind of effort, in the past, we've had members and people in this room who have said, we really want to support students. Um, so I invite any and all of you to think about how you might participate in this as well. So um, anyway, we want to see this field school I think we're pretty high likelihood to get that grant the next time around because the comments were like me, almost nothing. Um, so this transition year will be a really important one. Um, 
to keep the students going out there. So, um, oh, I was supposed to change the, this was my dramatic um, <laughs> landscape. But the building there that the young women are standing and, and sitting on is, that's how the, the hands-on program, they were working in a um, Adobe Pueblo and they built an Adobe Pueblo room. So they had that kind of learning experience. And this is uh, you know, on the completed building there. So research has always been an important part of what Archaeology Southwest does. And that's where uh, we could go on for hour after hour after hour. So um, you're just going to get a very short package here. Um, this is the one that, that I think really helped change the the perception of us as an organization, building the database of uh, sites across the US Southwest, uh, working with David Wilcox as a consultant and uh, putting it together, working with uh, Patrick Lyons, uh, who was uh, just finishing up his master's, his PhD in the Hopi area, uh, with uh, Brett Hill, who was just finished his PhD out of ASU and had an ecological approach, and then Jeff Clark, who had experience down here in the Southern Southwest and was a um, specialist in migration studies. Um, the dynamic of having those three people working together was incredible um, in the office, and it led to this estimation of population. I'm gonna just run you through a series of maps. So this, the map is gonna stay in the same place with, uh, but 50 years is gonna go by each time the, the screen changes. So starting in 1200, the dark areas are, are areas of denser population, Phoenix down in the lower part and, and the Four Corners area um, in the north. So not a big change in that first 50 years, um, a little bit of movement out of the uh, Four Corners into uh, the northern Rio Grande, but watch the four corners this time around. You've got people pretty much emptying out of that area and movement into the northern Rio Grande and farther south. And 1350, not dramatic change, but by 1400, you see population start to go down substantially. And finally, at 1450, it's not that people aren't there, it's that archeologically we cannot, we don't have things in the, in the archives that um, document the kinds of sites out there. So we've used the mission records of the early, late 1600s to kind of fill in what probably the scale of the landscape was. So, but it's a big dramatic population decline. It served to generate a lot of research questions and it's a vehicle, these maps are uh, approachable by a broad general audience um, and it inspires um, it, you know, a desire to know more and to ask questions. So this I think was an important, it led to a um, article in the Key Journal, American Antiquity. Um, so it's, it's, it was a change of pace of our growth I think when this came out in the early 2000s. And it also was the stimulus for expanding um, that database. So creating um, a, an expanded scale data of Cyber Southwest 1.0. If you can see the map there, the brown line, which extends around the perimeter there, is the, where 25,000 sites are uh, present in Cyber Southwest, which is a online database that any of you who have an email address could actually access um, by going to cybersouthwest.org. And then the current National Science Foundation grant uh, with Archaeology Southwest, U of A School of Anthropology, University of Colorado Boulder, and uh, ASU. That's an ongoing grant, and we're trying to bring in all of this work that's being done prior to development is really public money being invested in archeology span and getting that into a place where it can be publicly accessed and is available means that there's research can be done. Um, it can be uh, broadly accessed from, by diverse communities. And there we're working with a tribal working group as they're asking questions, they're, they're helping us structure 
what they're interested in seeing and providing feedback on, on this process. And the photograph um, at the bottom there is Caitlin Mayhew. Uh, she, she has a two-year fellowship and she's creating a project that focuses on um, the autumn speaking tribes, the, the Ton Autumn and the Gila River Indian community, probably Salt River Indian community, and working with them to look at the bird um, data that's in Cyber Southwest and bring their cultural um, information, linguistic and, and cultural traditions uh, related to that into a field guide. So a creative approach not everybody wants to figure out um, you know, how to do statistical analyses on um, very dry looking data, but um, looking at alternate ways to share information. This, folks may or may not be aware of this program. It's been a cooperative agreement um, with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and its goal is to uh, wipe out um, cultural resource crime on Indian reservations, and so it's focused on the uh, Archaeological Resource Protection Act and responding to looting and damage to cultural resources on uh, tribal lands. And there's also a website, which is a very important educational piece. And um, that's what I've just got a page of. So it's saving tribal history. It's another way that we're directly working with uh, tribes. And Steve may want to um, follow up on, on that. There was just a strategic plan uh, meeting here in Tucson for this program, um, and its next five years is my understanding. The commitment that we've made in subsequent strategic plans to work collaboratively with tribes has been really taken to heart, I think, by everyone on the staff, but it's really been assisted by particularly this uh, position paper on the left called Tribal Collaboration Model. Um, and it's because two of our staff members, uh, Ashley Thompson and Skylar Begay, Ashley's uh, Red Lake Ojibwe and uh, Skylar is uh, Dene or Navajo and uh, Mandan and Hadatsa, they've brought an energy, a perspective, a willingness to um, you know, be open with our staff, and it's had huge impacts on our, our ability to um, really ask ourselves, how can we collaborate with tribes um, as we plan new uh, projects, even as we pl plan staff lunches. Um, Saint Saint Navier has um, you know, capacity to um, deliver delicious food, which we found out. Um, so anyway, it's, 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 a, it's a how many ways can we ensure that we're trying to answer that question? How is our, our, our actions going to contribute to tribal collaboration? And in closing, um, the effort to um, explore and document and protect the San Pedro has been an ongoing since at least the 1990s. And throughout that time, there's always been one threat or another. And in the most recent one has been the power line, the Sunzia power transmission line uh, running down the valley. And we have joined, Archaeology Southwest has joined with tribal partners, the Tana Atum, and the San Carlos Apache tribe and the Center for Biological Diversity to uh, file a lawsuit against the BLM. And last Wednesday, there was a federal courthouse meeting um, and the entire Archaeology Southwest um, office marched down there to join the uh, court hearing but there were representatives from the Tana Autumn Nation, well represented from San Carlos Apache, from the community of Cascabel and, and the, the river. Um, they came in. They had to open up an auxiliary courtroom and televise it to them, them upstairs um, because we used up all the seats. Um, so 
it's, there wasn't an answer. The judge didn't make a uh, ruling on the injunction, request for an injunction, but um, it was heartwarming just to see that what we're doing is having a real impact. And it sort of came together in that experience. And um, if it doesn't work, we're still gonna go on. I mean, you just keep going and going. Um, so with that, um, I just wanna uh, say that I think Steve and I, oh, this is a view of just one of the things that we're concerned about out there. Uh, the roads, the clearing of this pristine landscape for uh, the towers, uh, this is where the, the project is at, at the present time. But uh, this is a quick overview of some of the key things that we've done over time. And I think we've got a really healthy um, organization. And we've got an ideal person in Steve to take over the, the leadership. So I am incredibly uh, grateful to all of you as supporters over time. And I will be in the audience uh, as a supporter <laughs> with all of you in the future. And I'm going to turn the talk over to Steve at this time. All right. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, I want to open it up the floor up to Q&A here in just a second. But it occurred to me many of you don't know anything about me. So I want to share with you a couple of vignettes that are going to contextualize my appearance here uh, with Archaeology Southwest and with Tucson. So I went to graduate school here. I was a little bit of a schizophrenic in that I did Neanderthal stone tools with Art Jelinek for my master's. And then I did the history of tree ring dating with Jeff Dean at the tree ring laboratory for my PhD. Um, but I defended my dissertation on the day the University of Arizona basketball team won the national championship. <laughs> It was a mixed blessing because I wanted to talk about my pride and joy, and my committee said, Steve, we have to go. <laughs> We're done. Um, it, was a, it was a great day. Um, then the next day, um, I spent loading cactuses onto a trailer that was being shipped to the Netherlands because a friend of ours shipped cactuses back in the day to the Netherlands. It's a really hard job. And then I took whatever jobs I could get doing contract archaeology in various places. And I came back in July. And Barbara Mills, I apologize because I swore I would never do this again, but I have to give you credit. I walked, in, I walked into the Department of Anthropology one day, and I saw Barbara. And she said, Steve, there's a postdoc at the Field Museum that's perfect for you. You need to apply. And I said, oh, that's good to know. And I looked at it, and I applied, and I got the job. So for the next nine years, I worked at the Field Museum in Chicago. My father had worked there when I was a very small child. He edited the Carter Ranch Pueblo monograph Paul Martin put together in 1962, 64, that era. Um, so for those of you who know that literature, my dad was involved in that. So I, I was around the Field Museum a lot as a child. I got to go back to Chicago. I got to go back to a world-class institution and work on their collections. Then, after two years of postdoc working on collections that were uncatalogued, I suckered them into promoting me into being the first head of collections in anthropology and got to work on preserving those collections for the next seven years. I then went to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science um, with a chance to chair my own department of anthropology, hired Chip Colwell, who many of you know here. He's on our board now at Archaeology Southwest. And for the next 12 years, he and I focused on repatriating and returning ancestors, their belongings, and doing ethically, ethically progressive repatriation uh, collaboration kinds of work. And then all of a sudden, Bill decides to retire, and the position for CEO of, at Archaeology Southwest opens up. And you know, if you pay attention to nonprofits and ethically grounded archaeology, there is no way that you're not going to apply for that job. And I did, and uh, thankfully got hired. And I'm not going to lie, it's, it's an intimidating proposition. Everybody I've spoken to said, you've got really big shoes to fill. And I'm like, my feet are wide, but they're not big. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. But it occurred to me on the way over here that the metaphor was wrong. It's not that I have to fill Bill's shoes. It's that I get to build on that foundation. And I'm a man who's prone to superlatives. It's not because I'm bombastic necessarily, but I need to feel in my heart that I am firmly involved in world-class stuff. Whether it was collections at the Field Museum, whether it was um, pushing the boundaries on repatriation in Denver, or coming back home to Tucson um, to, to lead a fantastic nonprofit. So this 
emphasis on superlatives um, is just kind of going haywire right now because of all of the things that I've been seeing and that you've been seeing here. I was at a lecture yesterday, a very small lecture that Sarah Herr of Desert Archaeology gave, and it's on the, uh, her view on the history of archaeology here in the Tucson Basin um, over time, and a lot of the, the amazing discoveries, building on what Paul and Susie Fish have done and others, have happened in the last 25 years since I've been gone from Tucson. And I come back in here and I look at what this organization is doing and I look at what's happening in this part of the world and it's absolutely astonishing. And what a thrill, what a thrill to come back here and have this opportunity to work with you and take this organization into the next generation, into the next manifestation of whatever this thing is. So a couple of words about where my thoughts are on that right now. Spent the last two months on, you know, diving in, getting to know the staff, engaging in what Dan Kimball says is a robust listening tour. Thank you for that phrase. It wasn't mine, but it's what I'm trying to do. Uh, a robust listening tour. And John Welch, who many of you all know and love, said at one point, we were walking in the San Pedro, and he said, Archaeology Southwest is what you get when you unleash PhDs from the tyranny of the academy. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I'm not going to lie. That's a fantastic line. Uh, it may end up on our stationery at some point. You never know. <laughs> so there's the research side of things. The PhD archaeologists at Archaeology Southwest have got a success rate with the National Science Foundation that dwarfs that, I would argue, I would bet, it dwarfs that of most university-based departments of anthropology and archaeology, which is fantastic. They are really good at getting federal money. But as Bill said, we didn't get the grant for the field school this year. And under the best of circumstances, funding rates from the federal government are about 10%. You can write the best application you can and still not get money because they only fund 10% of the applications that they get in a good year. There's an election coming up, folks, in November. It's a terrifying proposition. It's a terrifying proposition, and I've been saying for a while that I think actually nonprofits are going back to a model of private funding rather than public. That's a discussion for another day, but I'm looking for other ways that we can find a financially sustainable model for this organization that doesn't say ignore the National Science Foundation, but it means that we're not as reliant on the National Science Foundation uh, for our funding and for our work. How about this thing, folks? That. That is one is, yes. thank you. It's an amazingly well-branded artifact. And I choose that word, I choose that artifact. This thing is an amazingly popular magazine. Uh, you all know it, you all love it. And yet, the world is changing around us. Ask somebody who's below 40 how often they subscribe to print magazines, and they'll ask you, what's a print magazine? <laughs> So one of the really exciting things that we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks, how many of you know the name Corey Flintoff? NPR listeners remember back in the 80s, 90s, aughts, Corey Flintoff. I've become friends with Corey Flintoff through my work at the Denver Museum. He's an absolutely amazing guy. He got a master's in journalism at the University of Chicago. He went to the University of uh, Fairbanks up in Alaska. You know how he got his start in radio? Coming back to the values that Bill just outlined up here, Archaeology Southwest. You know how he got his start in radio? He needed a job, not loading cactuses in Alaska, but the local radio station in Bethel, Alaska said, we need a DJ. The only requirement to be the DJ at that radio station was that you had to be able to pronounce the local indigenous names properly. And Corey Flintoff could do it. That's how he got his start in radio. And now he's royalty. He is to me, I mean, he's my bromance. I'm not, I'm not afraid to admit it. He's my bromance because the man is positively onomatopoetic. He looks just like he sounds. Deep baritone, he's this grandfatherly looking figure and he's just a gentle, really smart, amazing guy. We're gonna bring him to Tucson in early April and we're gonna tour the San Pedro Valley with Bill and some of our tribal collaborators. We're gonna tour the Great Bend of the Gila and then Kate Sarther is gonna get together with Corey Flintoff and we're gonna write the narration to, an, to a two and a half minute to three minute video introducing Archaeology Southwest to everybody around the world. And the reason that I put up the magazine first is that the magazine is fantastic. It's a great entry point. Younger generations aren't listening to it, aren't reading magazines, but they're watching videos. 
So we'll produce the video for them, but then Corey Flintoff's voice on there adds legitimacy, for lack of a better term, better term, gravitas. It adds fame and fortune, not fortune, he went for work for NPR. It, <laughs> it adds fame to this thing. And, and without being flippant about it, the really important reason why I wanted to get him here is that having worked with him on some Russian gem carving sculptures of all things, I saw him encapsulate the essence of these sculptures. I'd been working on them for, decade, for a decade. And then he came to Denver and looked these things over and thought about it, and he encapsulated in 90 seconds the essence of what I was trying to say. And working with somebody like that, it's really an extraordinary phenomenon, somebody who's at the top of their game. So we're gonna do that. And then also with regard to verbal presentations, um, this is part of the madness that is my world. Um, I, wanna up the, I want our public presentations to have just as strong a brand as, as the magazine. I want it to be as confident, as strong, as engaging as, as the magazine. So uh, the, the staff may not forgive me for this, but uh, last week I had two comedian friends of mine come in and work a public speaking workshop for us. And I've done this a bunch of times before. It's not to get people to tell jokes. It's not to get them to stop being themselves. It is to get them to think about the connection between them and their audience. And as we go forth in the next few years with the team, we're gonna be having lots of folks do this kind of thing because it's an amazing group of people. And I want them out with you, in front of you, just as much as me. Um, because it's, it, the, the work that they're doing is extraordinary. It really is, and you all know that. Um, but I think sometimes it is fun to come back into a situation and say, holy smokes, you all, do you know what you're dealing with here? This is world class. And then so the final end of that is that um, I have done a lot of work in the global cultural heritage preservation sphere over the years. I've repatriated ancestors to Kenya. I've worked with the Midjikenda tribes in coastal Kenya. Um, there's a huge cultural heritage preservation network out there, as Jeff Altschul knows very, very well. Um, I want Archaeology Southwest to be known amongst that group. This doesn't mean that we're gonna engage in repatriations from California to Asia or something like that. It doesn't mean that we're gonna get out of our sphere. I want those folks to know what's been happening here. And that's one of my goals for this organization over the next few years. But it's all gonna be grounded in what the staff is interested in, what our capacity is, what you all think is reasonable and all that kind of thing. But. Um, that's where I'm at. I am so glad to be here. Thank you all for your time and attention listening. <clears throat> Any questions for Bill, me, Linda, <laughs> anybody? Do you want me to take a mic in the audience? Yeah, good idea. Dan's having a heart attack. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's a terrible, so. <laughs> Congratulations, both of you. Thank you. Uh, uh, job well done, and job uh, that will be well done, yeah. it's obvious. Um, I, I think your communication outreach is exactly the right thing. Um, and But I'm wondering, also, are you focusing at all, at all on your congressional delegation, on getting the word out to all of them, so that they, whatever they're doing, can understand that, as you say, the world-class efforts are happening here in their district, and they can carry that message so well for you if they understand it, so. Really good question, Kit, and thank you for that. This is, you know, it, Clint Eastwood one time, once said in one of his movies, a man's got to know his own limitations. And he was probably at the wrong end of a gun or something like that, but a person has to know their own limitations, and there are certain things that I'm not well versed in. Lobbying and DC and all of that is one of them that I'm not well versed in. Uh, but I've got some inroads over there and we've got some experience there. And so I've got two trips planned to DC uh, between now and June 1st with a long list of folks to go and meet and, and, and engage in that. You wanna say anything about Great Bend of the Gila and things? I think the, one of the partners that we've had is the Conservation Lands Foundation. They've got an amazing um, network of, of people who are connected in, in DC and we're working with the Wilderness Society. We have a, a lot of partners who, you know, we may not have the connections, you know, strong, but uh, Mr. Gohalva uh, is the Great Bend of the Gila supporter. Uh, I think there's a good chance that that will happen this year if, uh, you know, we continue our 
role of having Schuyler Begay work with the tribes um, has had a big impact. Um, the Mr. Grahalva is in the process now of, of reaching out to tribes, and, and I think once that happens, Grand Canyon got a new national monument very quickly after the tribes, you know, came together and uh, you know spoke in a in a single set of voices. And so, anyway, I think there's it is an important arena, uh, and we have ways to reach out to it. And in fact, April sixteenth is the day when the Conservation Lands Fund and is hosting a group of people to basically make the march over to drop the bill, as I understand it. Not drop the bill, drop the legislation. <laughs> I had in mind that we need to pay attention to. So um, that, I mean, they're very, very important and they're very, very good. I mean, world class. Yep, fully That's agreed. <laughs> yep, yep, fully agreed, Donna. Um, nothing's going to happen to the publication. I mean, that's that's going to be one of the. I, I don't even want to envision a scenario where that's going to happen. However, um, and just to let you know, you know, I've been around museums, libraries, all that kind of kind of thing. I used to walk my dog by Loyola University campus in Chicago in winter time, and this is very strange. But you know, when you walk by the library, the the ex the exhaust from the library and the air system smelled like journals and books. <laughs> and, and I actually kind of liked it. So um, it, it, it's not going to go anywhere anywhere at all. And Kate and I now share a building in the North Casita at the Bates Mansion complex. It ain't going to go anywhere. And uh, we just have to reckon with the changes that are that are happening out there. And, and you know, we're going to create one video. We can do derivative videos after that. It's just adding another arrow to that communications quiver in a way that, that and, and Archaeology Southwest has had videos in the past, but, but we're going to double down on that effort to try and diversify and expand the reach a little bit more beyond the magazine reading community, as lovely as that community is. And as you saw in that last photo, they've already made the pads for all these power. How can we help stop that? Uh, well, I think we're in a fairly much a last gasp effort. I mean, again, there's been approvals of construction by the Bureau of Land Management. And this is, we're going after the BLM for not adequately complying with the National Historic Preservation Act. And I think there's a pretty strong, clear case of that. But um, I don't know, the ju judge may just decide this project is so far along that it's it's um, you know too late. Um, the support that is you know showed up at the courtroom there um, feels good, um, and and there's another state level uh, effort because there the uh, there's a requirement for the the, the uh, pattern energy who's who is Sunzia, um, to complete a cultural landscape study before they initiate construction. They have already violated that. So, um, so I think we're pushing at all the legal buttons that can, can uh, you know, roll things, slow things down. Um, but it's a, it's a, we're way behind the curve in terms of uh, where we would want to be. So I don't have a simple answer as to how you can help. You can support the folks out. Cascabel uh, has a um, online uh, funding opportunity. Um, we're going to keep at it uh, till the end. Um, thanks. My my vision for the future of research work at uh, at Archaeology Southwest is to step out of the way of the PhDs and let them remain entrepreneurial. Um, that being said, I think that the field school doing a collections-based and, and slightly field-based rather than excavation-based field school uh, is a good idea for this time. There is a threat to the archaeological discipline that we're not teaching enough people 
how to dig properly. Um, but that's a discipline-wide phenomenon, not something that Archaeology Southwest is going gonna, is gonna to solve. I'm still trying to learn the research from all these great scholars. It's not where I was um, immersed as a graduate student or as a professional. Um, so I'm learning from them, about them, and, and watching what they, what they do. Cyber Southwest is an amazing, amazing tool, and it is not cheap. And as you all know, the digital technologies um, need continuous support. Uh, it's easier, frankly, to curate an object on the shelf than it is to curate a digital version of that object because of Moore's Law, because of planned obsolescence in the computer technology, the software and the hardware and so on. So I do get a little bit nervous with a whole lot of computer stuff, but that's my own issue. Um, but, you know, let's talk again in six months and I might have a better idea. But my experience in two different academically inclined museums is that you, and my philosophy is you hire the best and brightest, you get them the resources they need to get the job done, and then you get out of the way and let them get the job done. You step in only if there's really some issues or problems. But PhDs are oftentimes better positioned to be productive when they're left to be entrepreneurial. How's that for a cop out, folks? <laughs> <laughs> So basically, uh, I wasn't there at the strategic planning session, but it, it didn't change much is, is the, the short answer. Um, the, we have been reaching out to, um, initially it was pretty much Arizona based and we've responded though to a wide variety, We've done um, damage assessments like up in Montana, Idaho, that, uh, working in Nevada. So I think the scope in terms of geography is going to expand and the number of trainings, I think trying to build capacity for tribes to do this work, not have it all have to be hired through Archaeology Southwest. I think that's the biggest thrust. And the um, ultimately the Archaeology Southwest's strength, I think, that they bring to it is our focus and ability to uh, promote the educational element of it. The, the affiliating with the ARPA, Archaeological Resource Protection Act program, kind of gave, brought us in, in touch with the stick. Um, we're better with the carrot and that aspect of, of the, the way the legal system works, but I think it, it's a good um, partnership to have with the BIA. Uh, they, they're willing and able to prosecute. Um, and you know, that's not our favorite thing to, to get involved in court cases, but um, we see, seem to keep getting there from time to time. Um, so anyway, I think it's, it's a strong, important program. And basically, it's going to have a geographic expansion is a short answer. I'm going to sw switch over to Greg here. Has informed you in terms of ideas for your director of archaeology at Southwest. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Greg. Yeah, sapiens.org is an online archaeological magazine um, that was founded in 2015 by Chip Colwell. Again, on our board, many of you know him. He wanted to create a. Uh, he called it the Huffington Post of anthropology at the time. Not really the right model there, but. Um, he, he said at one point that, that if you just go onto TV and try and learn anthropology, you could learn more from Anthony Bourdain than you could from documentaries about anthropology. And it's a really, really interesting insight. So he went to the, to, uh, the Wenner Grand Foundation and got a huge grant to start sapiens.org at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I'm an opportunist. I said, hey, I've got lots of weird ideas in my head from two decades worth of museum work. What if I provided a column for you guys? And his managing editor at the time said, well, what would we call it? And I said, I don't know. And then she learned a little bit more about me. And she said, how about we call that column Curiosities? Hmm, that's a really good title because I could write about many, many different things. And I did. Um, I have an identical twin brother. I've got a genetic clone in this world. And he went into finance and he went off into a totally different realm. And I would come back from digging in southwestern France or being out in the southwestern deserts of Arizona and end up in, a, in um, uh, John Nuveen and company in Chicago in boots and you know sunburnt and all that. And his buddies would say like, where did you just come from? And I would tell them. And they never said how boring. 
They never said how irrelevant. They oftentimes said, I always wanted to do that, but could never figure out how. So I've spent a lot of my career trying to match up the opportunities that are present in this room with the opportunities that are present in that room. And Sapiens is one vehicle for doing that. And then yes, of course, seeing the, the, the reach for Sapiens and then the reach for the Archaeology Southwest magazine and other kinds of things, it's absolutely extraordinary. Sapiens has been read in every country on the planet, including North Korea. And we like to think it was Kim Jong-un himself. Uh, <laughs> because he studied in Switzerland and he knows English. He can read English. One of the columns that I wrote went viral. I'm not gonna tell you which one, but um, it went viral, 450,000 reads. Now we can debate whether or not that's a, 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 a meaningful impact that somebody reads something, but that's the metric that the internet uses. And of all the 63 columns that I've written, two million people have read those things. It's hard to argue with those numbers. There is a beauty in the internet. There is a beauty in other means of communication. So yes, it has impacted who I am as a scholar um, and what I think Archaeology Southwest can do. It's why I'm trying to push some traditional boundaries in amongst the staff and what we think is normal, not to force people to do anything, but to encour encourage them to do something. Mexico, question mark. <laughs> you, you take that one. I'm not. A, <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> what do you say? So, Archaeology Southwest says that we deal with the Mexican Northwest and the U.S. Southwest. Um, and in magazine issues, that has been true. We partnered with Paul on one of our uh, very popular issues on Pocky May. Um, we've, I, the bottom line, I think, Paul, is just our people are busy enough as, as working on the north side of the border, and they're, they haven't got the um, skills of, you know, and comfort, you know, w working back and forth across the border, developing those kind of relationships. I mean, the, the key of our tribal collaboration model is relationships. And if you're gonna work with tribes, building relationships are, is very time consuming. And I think we've just, there's an interest and I actually think, thinking back on the research, I think some of the critiques I have of, of how we've looked at research um, and, and interpreted work that we've done north of the border is that we're not adequately informed about what's going on south of the border. So I, again, I, if I had seven more lives, <laughs> um, I would love to you know, push people um, in that direction, but I, I don't see it there in the current energy and, and directions that the organization's going. Um, the Bates Mansion is a big facility. <laughs> Just saying. Both sides of that artificial boundary and I'd love to see it become more formalized at some point. <laughs> I'm absolutely not going to disagree. Um, and, you know, there's, there are so many. I mean, I, I was looking forward to working with you on how uh, promoting ranching and conservation are preservation strategies. And uh, you described the marriage of, of um, archaeology and Ethno history and Dale and, and, and Arthur have accomplished that on a personal level. <laughs> but um, the how, how much funding is in the Southwest Center to <laughs> reorganize the, the staff there to focus on exactly what you're talking about? I mean, it's, it's one of those things, it's, it, it's a huge opportunity. Um, and it's, not where I see the Archaeology Southwest current researchers. I mean, they're, they're again, somewhat uh, geographically um, displayed along the Gila River, upper Gila, middle, and lower. And, um, it, and working together, they're synthesizing on a, on a large scale um, synthesis. I mean, Jeff Altschul is in, you know, very committed to archaeological synthesis. and. Um, these kinds of issues uh, take a huge amount of effort, and I don't know if there's opti optimi optimistic other places to in you know bring uh, 
those kinds of uh, strategies together. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm retired. Right. Right. <laughs> and the way, I, the way that I'll close that is to say that my robust listening tour is also, mm. I'm perfectly willing to have a robust brainstorming tour. So let's brainstorm, let's listen, let's keep coming together. It's so good to see you all here for the first time since 2019, it's amazing. Uh, thank you all very, very much for coming out today and your support for Archaeology Southwest and for that guy. Thank you.